I think it is worth waiting for this. And uh, th thank you for the very kind invitation. And uh, I blame Phoenix uh, for this such a challenging topic. Transcendental patch, good for a lifetime. <clears throat> Um, I really enjoyed the meeting, and uh, it has been very technological and very visionary. And to talk about Transcendental Apache, I feel like I'm on the wrong side of history. And, um, but, and also listening to the Valve Sparing talk and the use of conduit, it is important to understand it's not good or bad. It is just different options dealing with a very challenging problem. The, the morphology drives the physiology and the physiology drives the outcome. So let me take you through some of my thoughts about transcendental patch, whether it is good for a lifetime or not. And uh, if you may allow me, it was 60 years ago, Tetralogy of Fallout was repaired. In a way, that was the freeway to the lung in the making 60 years ago, but we're still talking about it. We have a problem. And, um, it was a very exciting time. Uh, there was a Blaylock shunt for the blue babies, and the cross circulation was used. The oxygenators were in the experimental stage, and, but, but to come up with a repair, a repair instead of a palliation, was really a very critical moment in our short history of pediatric cardiac surgery and cardiology. And this is the original picture from uh, Lily High's paper. It was a right ventriculotomy approach. I'm sure the right ventriculotomy was exaggerated, uh, but you can see the, the morphology with the anterior cephalate deviation of the outer septum, the very significant outflow tract obstruction, and uh, you can see the VSD and cephalate uh, to the uh, tricuspid valve. The, at that time, the philosophy for repair tetralogy follow was to get rid of that obstructive physiology once and for all. And, uh, and then this is a very important paper for surgery for tetralogy follow by Aldo Castaneda. And um, he not only described the way to do a resection of the LVOT, and as you all know, I'm talking about the transcendental patch, but in order to do a proper transcendental patch, to do a repair of the trilogy follow, there are certain things you need to fulfill in order to have a good repair at the end. He mentioned about patch closure of the VSD, because before that, Lili High was closing the VSD with direct sutures, and that may be one of the reasons why the results were not so good. And Aldo described the importance of not compromising the tricuspid valve in the repair of the trilogy follow because it is part of your outflow tract as your inlet valve and also to preserve the conduction tissue. And then he talked about how to do a resection of the LVOT. Let me take you through for one minute. Uh, this is the uh, Crista uh, ventricularis and uh, through a right ventriculotomy, he will undermine, he will undermine the parietal band and with that undermining of the tissue, it opened up the angle uh, of the RVOT. So that already increased the size of the RVOT. And another move would be to divide the septal bands. By doing that, it dropped the crystal posteriorly. So you can imagine with this picture uh, upside down, the RVOT would be much wider just by doing a good resection of the septal bands and the parietal bands. And by doing that dropping of the crystal, one could see the VSD and it would facilitate the closure, sometimes a very awkward VSD in tetralogy followed. Now, just one step further, this was a right ventriculotomy. Try to imagine to do that through a right atrium in a three or four kilogram baby. It can be quite challenging and for me, up to this time, I still find it quite mysterious. There's no uniform description, description of how to do a resection of the LVOT in tetralogy of followed. So uh, the, the results were poor, uh, but I think the mortality fell or improved a lot with, with this uh, very clear documentation by Kirkland. Uh, high right heart pressure after tetralogy of follow repair was not good. It will increase the mortality, it will increase the morbidity. At the same time, we all know, we all know very well, the pulmonary regurgitation uh, 
despite the loading of the right heart, was very well tolerated in the early period of tetralogy of follow repair. This paper from Lily High back in 86, he looked at his own data and he said it has been what if the transcendental patch was properly used because that could deal with entire range, or the infinite range of the LVOT morphology in tetralogy followed. The very few bad effects on the myocardium over many years, these patients have now been observed. Unfortunately, within quite a short time, uh, the, the bad modified chronic volume overload of the right heart with pulmonary regurgitation and the legacy of aldocassinate, a right ventriculotomy, we were seeing the regurgitation with increased right heart volume, increased QRS duration, and all these which you know very well. And, uh, and this paper came from uh, Yves Dudicum. He left us from, uh, went back to Belgium. He looked at the, the long-term data. And because we are talking about lifetimes, therefore I only use long-term data. Uh, 25 years, about 200 tetralogy of fallow patients. It became quite obvious from about 20 years onwards, from about 20 years onward, before that it was quite tolerable, but 20 years onward, there was an increasing prevalence of reoperations, pulmonary valve replacement in the tetralogy group with regurgitation. On the other hand, if you look at this particular line, the, the one with isolated pulmonary commissarotomy with or without a transendular patch, those patients have a normal lifespan with normal quality of life. And in fact, even with a dotted line, the group with tetralogy followed, but without a patch, I presume it was the pink tetralogy. If it was repair well, they have a lifelong uh, reduction of the, uh, the risk of PVR. So, I promise you, I would not talk about PVR after this. Um, the, the, the patients for pulmonary valve replacement have been extremely well characterized. There are so many articles, the indications, and we, we know the benefits and uh, the possible benefits and uncertainties. But I think we should concentrate on this. The, the first time reoperation could be quite low risk in big programs. and. Uh, that is doable and it offers a lot of benefit to those patients with a bad right ventricle. But we have to keep in mind, no matter how good, there's always a risk with that open heart operation. And, uh, but I'm coming to the fact that if we have to keep on reoperating, it comes upon that we cannot do any more within acceptable boundaries. And uh, so I thought at Great Ormond Street, rather than looking at the patients who had PVR, we look at the population of patients who had that privilege of living a life without PVR to see whether we would identify some criteria we could use to influence our first operation, how we can manage a transcendular patch without an operation. It is part of a lifetime management. So uh, this came from Frigiola and uh, we, we we, we have to thank Kate Bull, our cardiologist at Great Ormond Street. She religiously, he, she religiously collected all the tetralogies who had repair at Great Ormond Street from about 1964 to 2009. I think the study was stopped at 2011. And uh, these were patients at Great Ormond Street, only at Great Ormond Street, and there were 185, and 95 died within the first year. And uh, 970, they were alive with no PVR. And out of that, uh, there were about 180 who had a PVR. And uh, there were attrition along the time. And after all the censoring, there were 716 tetralogy of follows patients who had repair, and they had not had a PVR. So that was the population we were looking at. And you might have seen this slide earlier on, but let me take you through it one more time. So from 1964 to 2009, 700 patients alive with no pulmonary valve replacement. And uh, I mean, the, the first message is that some patients with tetralogy follow repair, they behave very differently. They tolerate things quite differently. So again, it comes back to the first point I made. The morphology dictates a lot of things. But uh, out of this 
population. One was patient who died with no PVR. But here you can also see there were some information we can learn. Uh, in the 60s, in the 70s, the mortality of the mortality, for, the mortality for tetroid repair was quite high. It was about 10, 20 percent. But across the, the passage of time, in year 2000, the mortality for tetralogy follow first time was less than 2 percent. And from here onwards, for the last 10 years, at Great Ormond Street, the mortality was less than 0.4 percent. So that is something which uh, we are quite pleased about. And, but at the same time, we had more patients. We had more patients who had tetralogy followed, who required reoperations. And 30% of those patients had a PVR around the 40 years of follow-up. And this is quite uh, interesting. Within the 700 patients, um, with very clever ideas from the ladies, Kate Bull and Frigiola, uh, they decided it would be workable to randomly sample 10 patients from each surgical decade in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000. And it would give us sufficient power to do analysis to find out the research question. How long or what sort of phenotypic characters we can use to help us to deal with the very first operation, to minimize the risk of reoperation. And out of that, uh, tech category, you can see the age range and the time of the study. Uh, the transatrial transpulmonary repair were in the 90s and 2000, and the transcendular patch, patch was used throughout that time frame. Uh, it is not that busy if I take you through this. And uh, they all had MRI, CPACs, and the detailed echo. And uh, we would try to find out what it means to be surviving with a transcendular patch without PVR over a long period of time. And if you look at the right heart index dimension, they were slightly bigger than normal. The ejection fraction was normal. The left heart dimensions were normal. And the pulmonary regurg regurgitation in the group without PVR they were only about 21% the mean. And uh, the velocity across the outflow track was about 2.2 uh, meter per second. Uh, don't look at each individual scan. Uh, th this was just trying to use the uh, MRI imaging in the 20 patients, about 20 patients, older than 35 years of age. We looked at the older age group. We wanted to understand how they could survive the tetraegephalo repair with a patch for that length of time, what were the phenotypic pictures? They, they, the LVOT, they were not aneurysmal, and they all had mild degree of, of obstruction. It could be valva, subvalva, or supervalva. And the branch pulmonary arteries, they were good enough. They were not significantly stenosed. And uh, the, the degree of regurgitation, mild to moderate. So we, we are beginning to see a certain picture, if that is what we could do right at the first time round, we may potentially have a group of patients who have tetraegephalo repair. They can do without a pulmonary valve. And uh, using that, those patients, the 35 years after surgery, with normal exercise capacity, and uh, we plot them uh, against the degree of regurgitation and the pulmonary valve diameter in Z score. What we noticed was that Apart from this outlier, the pulmonary valve diameter was near the normal Z score for that body weight. And the degree of regurgitation was mild to moderate. And uh, for this outlier, in fact, he had a PVR uh, within the study time. So, how best to leave an imperfect LVOT? That is the question we ask every time we do a tetralogy follow. I'm not talking about tetralogy follow with a good pulmonary valve, good annulus, or the pink tetralogy. That is sorted. We are talking about those with a Z score, say, less than minus two or minus three. What do we do? If we leave the orifice too small, they would have a right heart hypertension, and the right ventricle would not have, as I quote, infinite power to deal with it over a longer time. On the other hand, if we leave it for too big, we deal with the chronic volume overloaded right heart. And based on our long-term data and some conjecture, uh, we, we said with or without a patch, 
of the followed repair if the pulmonary, pulmonary annulus should be between minus 1.3 Z or 0.5 Z. And mild obstruction is protective, and the PVR could be avoided more often. And uh, there was similar clinical data, a long-term follow-up data from Korea, looking at the right heart dimensions in patients who had a pressure load at the right ventricle after tetragyphalo repair, and they demonstrated that the, the right heart dimensions were better than the, group, than the group who got no stenosis, and it was better not at the expense of the systolic dysfunction. And there was very elegant experimental work, again confirming the idea that some element of obstruction in the presence of regurgitation would be beneficial. That was in uh, 2005. This was a pressure volume curve. And uh, if you have time, this is really a very nice study. But that idea, but that idea wasn't new. That idea was already created in 1961 in the same institution by Gabodi in San Francisco, the same institution. Uh, at that time, the Lily High said the results for tetragyphalo transventricular repair was good. But Gabodi said, no, I have saw, I've seen some really bad outcomes associated with severe pulmonary regurgitation. And so there were differences in opinions. And he did a, a beautiful uh, experiment uh, in dogs. Um, the old fashioned measuring the stroke volume. And uh, he, he did the experiment in four settings. One with an intact pulmonary valve. The one second would be pulmonary insufficiency with myostenosis. The third category would be one with pure insufficiency with no stenosis. And the last category would be the one with severe pulmonary stenosis. And uh, what he found, he superimposed the experimental work onto one with a similar uh, axis, the volume and the time. And he started with the beginning of the systole. So every time there was an increase in the stepwise, it would be the systole. And um, you can see with, within the first three groups, the systolic work was similar, except the last group with the severe pulmonary stenosis, uh, it just wouldn't do. On the other hand, if you look at the group with pulmonary insufficiency without stenosis, you can see that the systolic work was similar, but there was quite important reflux, quite important reflux, and it was creating a much reduced cardiac output at the end of that. Compare that with the one with mild stenosis. It was similar systolic work, but the reflux was much less, and you can see the slope of the curve was much better. So the cardiac output was not much compromised. So this is what he said back in 1961. Without being quantitative at this time, it is our impression that a mild gradient in the RVOT is better than no gradient, and that the exact amount of gradient is not that important within a reasonable range. So we are still at that stage. And um, so in conclusions, a transcendular patch based on our long-term data based on our conjecture, could be good enough for 35, 40 years without a PVR. We are not that ambitious to say it is good for a lifetime, but only data can tell. But from the long data, from what we've seen, we are able to improve what we do for the first operation for this tetralogy followed, that is, the RVOT should be repaired and the dimension should be around the normal expected Z-score in order to achieve good early results and also a durable RV function. And um, as we all know, the first operation determines the destiny. Thank you.